Okay, so let's try this again, shall we? I don't know what happened to the last video, but hopefully this one will work out way better. So in this one, um, we are going to talk about absolutism in England and Spain and what it really looked like. We've talked about Spain previously with France, uh, and then also a little bit with Central Europe and Russia as well. But today we're going to continue talking about Spain because apparently Spain was being a little pesky during this time. So one of the first things that we are going to start with is the Spanish Inquisition. So in Spain, um, they were actually unified under the marriage of Queen Isabella of Castile and Queen and King Ferdinand of Aragon. So in Spain, let me just, here is the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula with Portugal. Spain was divided into regions like most of Europe at the end of the Middle Ages. And so because the princess of Castile married the prince of Aragon, both would eventually become king and queen and unite Spain officially under one monarchy. Isabella and Ferdinand would actually become very important because they would play a little bit of a role uh, in what was happening in England because their daughter, Catherine, would go on and marry Henry VIII. She would be the first wife of Henry VIII. Um, Queen Catherine, you know, the one that was divorced to start off the six. Yeah, that's same one. So in Spain, there was this desire with Isabel and Ferdinand to really conquer all of the territory and bring all of the Iberian Peninsula under Spain. So they needed to force out the Moors, so the North African Muslims that had been there since the Umayyad dynasty, since the Abbasids, you know, um, expanded. So they really wanted to control this territory called Granada, um, under one, one monarchy. So they needed to force out the Moors. So this would establish and begin what's called the Reconquista. Uh, and this would happen in 1492. That year should also sound familiar because that was also the year that Columbus set sail on the ocean blue. So the Reconquista basically meant that all of the Jews and the Muslims who had been occupying the Iberian Peninsula either had to convert or they had to leave. And if you decided to convert, um, you were watched to make sure that you really did convert. Uh, and if people at all thought that you hadn't actually converted, then you would be arrested, you would be tortured, you would be put on trial in the Spanish Inquisition, and that killed 5,000 plus people. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this before, right? With the nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition because it really came out of nowhere. So here's the map. So we had um, the Arabs, we had the Umayyads, we had the Abbasid dynasty, the caliphates. They expanded establishing Islam in Northern Africa. And in this area, they would become known as the Moors. And they would cross the Strait of Gibraltar into Spain. And that's where they had lived for like 700 years until Isabella and Ferdinand decided that those Muslim lands needed to be Christian lands once again. So they converted or forced out. If you actually go to southern Spain, you can see a lot of cultural and architectural influences of the Moors that are still around today. And some of these, uh, and what you see are some pictures taken of some of the buildings from southern Spain. And then here are some images of the Spanish Inquisition. Some of these images y'all actually used. One of the most insane things about the Spanish Inquisition out of the laundry list of them is the fact that after you were put on trial, you may have confessed your sins, you would still be brought out and strapped to a post and burned alive because they couldn't trust you. What? Ugh. So, 
back to relations with England. While eventually Spain and England go to war, they were already very upset, intentions were high, at the fact that Henry VIII divorced Catherine of Aragon. Wow, Yeah, so Henry VIII calls this Protestant movement in England, which resulted in the chi- two children. One would be staunchly Catholic, Mary I, a.k.a. Bloody Mary, and then you would have Elizabeth, who would be a Protestant queen. So you had this conflict here. Um, on the other side, in Spain, Isabel and Ferdinand's son, Philip I, who would become king of Spain, um, had a child, Charles V, who would become the Holy Roman Empire and have a child, Philip II. We've talked about Philip II here. Uh, Philip II would marry Mary, would marry, bloody Mary, so many Marys, um, of England, but unfortunately she would die at the hands of, yeah, her own sister. So after the death of Mary I, in order to bring Spain and England closer together, Philip proposes to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was like, no, you're Catholic, I'm Protestant, I ain't doing it. Uh, and they also were fighting over land in the New World. Um, women were thought to be too bold so that Elizabeth needed a man to take over things. Yeah, so Elizabeth just straight up says no. And as a result, you have Philip II of Spain go to war with Elizabeth I. Oh, yeah. So Philip II's father, Charles I, he ruled over Spain, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, a lot of the American colonies at that point in time. And he was known as the Holy Roman Emperor because he was staunchly Catholic. Um, But nothing went right for him. So he ended up abdicating his throne. And he gave his throne to his son, Philip in Spain. So his throne in Spain went to Philip, but his brother got the Holy Roman Empire, which is not holy. It's not Roman and it's not an empire, but whatever. So Philip II became king. Uh, And at the height of Spanish greatness, he controlled everything politically and culturally. He defeated the Turkish navies. Um, he was a crusader for Catholicism. He's actually revered as the most Catholic king um, of the Counter Reformation. Um, in Belgium and Netherlands, they would become part of Philip's empire, and they were mostly Calvinist. And Philip tried to crush those. Wah, wah. So William the Silent, aka William of Orange, which will become significant a little bit later, actually led the resistance against uh, Philip. And there would end up being a truce. So the northern states state, um, would be the United Providence of, of, of Netherlands and control themselves outside of Spain. And at this point in time, Spain was the greatest empire. They would soon fall because of pointless, useless wars. So Elizabeth I, she took over and she was the head of the state and the church the Church of England, right? Or the Anglican Church. Um, She was Protestant, but she was also very accepting of Catholics because of what happened with her sister, Mary I, when Mary I was in control of England. Bloody Mary, because she tried to force England to go back to Catholicism, and it was a war, and it was so incredibly bloody. Yeah. So she actually wanted... France and Spain to be evenly matched with England, you know, support the weaker countries to keep a balance of power so that nobody, nobody gets too powerful over the next. Well, Philip II didn't want that. He wanted to completely take over England and end Protestant, Protestantism. And he tried this through marriage, first through Mary the first. And then tried to do it with Elizabeth, but that didn't work. So he waged war. And he sent the Spanish Armada, which is the fleet of warships, to go invade England. And there would be a lot of naval battles. And England would win. To Europe's 
complete surprise because the Spanish Navy was the greatest. You know, they also had an insane amount of money, but English fire ships would actually use strategy to their advantage. So they would force the Spanish Armada North, a storm sent the Armada off course around Scotland and destroyed most of their ships. This is actually referred to as the Protestant wind. Um, yeah, it just happenstance, right? So there were a lot of internal threats to Elizabeth's power. So you had Mary the First, Bloody Mary, she dies. Well, then you enter Mary, Queen of Scots, which is completely different from her sister. Mary, Queen of Scots, is actually her cousin. Um, she is staunchly Catholic. She is a Scottish queen, and she supports European Catholics. She was raised um, by French royalty, and Elizabeth had her imprisoned and later beheaded because she feared that Mary, Queen of Scots, posed a threat to the throne of England. So as a result, Elizabeth I, who never marries and has no heir, has to choose her cousin Mary's son to become king. So the son that is now motherless because Elizabeth got a little paranoid and had her killed. Oh yeah. So that officially ends the Tudor line uh, in England. So this is just an example. The English were greatly outnumbered by the Spanish Armada. Victory should have quickly gone to Spain, but it didn't. So people actually interpret the English victory as God intervening for the female Protestant queen. Because still, like, females can't do anything, right? So as we see in this family line, you have Elizabeth, or Henry VIII here, who has a laundry list of wives, produces three children, um, Mary, Elizabeth, and Edward. Edward did take over, but he died very young because he was not healthy whatsoever. Uh, so Mary takes over and then Elizabeth. Well, when this ends, you have like, you have no heir. You have no Tudor heir. So you have to go over here. So Mary, Queen of Scots, right here, who marries Henry Stuart, has a son, James, who is married to Anne of Denmark. This is the Stuart line of succession. So after Elizabeth dies, the last Tudor, James I, comes to, comes to power. I know, family trees. They're really messed up. So um, as a result of all of this, Stuart coming, Stuart's coming to power. England had a lot of turmoil during the Stuarts, uh, and it was mostly due to religious reasons, because you had Stuarts who were staunchly Catholic now ruling over a Protestant kingdom. So when James VI of Scotland became king of England once Elizabeth died, he claimed divine right of kings, this belief that kings received power from God, as we have stated, now, this was in direct conflict with Parliament, because in Scotland, King James could rule ab absolutely, like he had absolute power. But in England, you had the Magna Carta, which limited the king and queen's power. So there were a lot of issues. And then also you throw in Protestants, uh, throw in the Puritans, who are seeking to purify even the Protestant church, a little crazy. Um, they had conflict with the king, so they escaped and went off to the Americas. And these were the pilgrims that landed in Plymouth Rock. Um, a part of this whole debacle with the Stuarts, you had an uprising. It's called the Gunpowder Treason and Plot, and it happened on the 5th of November. Remember, remember the 5th of November. So this is known as Guy Fawkes Day in England. Uh, Guy Fawkes was a staunch Catholic, and he was trying to kill James I and blow up Parliament, but he was unsuccessful. Um, underneath Parliament, there are all of these tunnels, and he was caught red-handed by stacking uh, barrels of gunpowder around the pillars. Uh, so it is now 
commemorated each day on how, you know, this plot, this treasonous plot was overthrown. But this doesn't end anything, really. It, you know, and it kind of incentivizes people. So we move from James to Charles. So Charles I fought Parliament and the Puritans. He actually had to have Parliament members arrested for treason. Wah, wah. This led to a civil war, and it was, king, it was between the king and parliament that was led by Oliver Cromwell. Now, those who followed Cromwell were known as roundheads. Those who were loyalists to the king were known as cavaliers. Well, in this case, the roundheads actually won because uh, Charles I was killed. Huh, actually beheaded on January 30th, 1649. And it scared the rest of Europe because if this can happen in England, then it can happen everywhere else. And this officially makes Oliver Cromwell the king because Parliament chose Cromwell as the king. And he was a savage. He was a military dictator like no other. So he takes over in 1649 and he rules until his death in 1658. And it was disastrous. So because of this, we have, after the English Civil War, we have what's called the Restoration. And this is to restore the royal family to power. So Parliament, who now has power once again after Cromwell dies, um, chooses a new king. And that new king would be Charles II, who was the son of Charles I, who was beheaded. Wah, wah. As you can tell from the map here, before Charles was beheaded, way before, you can see that there's this growing parliamentary movement. And then it just, right? So once you have Charles, the second come in and take over, um, you start to see a, another breakdown in the Stuart family tree. So you have the Stuarts, James, so James the first of England, James the sixth of Scotland, right? So in red, you have the secession of kings. So since the Prince of Wales, unfortunately, passed away. Um, it went to Charles I, who had children. Mary Stuart, over here, married William of Orange. Remember that name, right? We'll come back to it. But the oldest son here, Charles II, gave up power, and so it became James I, who had children. You had Mary II, and you had Queen Anne. And Mary II would marry William III, who is the son of William and Mary. So basically, he married his cousin. Gotta love it. <laughs> Gotta love it so much. So the reason why you see all of this red here is because we have another breakdown in the line of secession. So James II, who is the son of Charles I, he is a staunch Catholic, Catholic son and Protestant daughters, Parliament wanted to rid themselves of King James because how on earth could a Catholic king rule over a Protestant country and be head of a Protestant church? So they invited his daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, who is a Dutch leader, to invade England. So William and Mary did. And as a result, James I and his family fled. This is called the Glorious Revolution because there was like very little bloodshed. In 1689, William and Mary would officially become queen and they would sign the English Bill of Rights that basically said that Parliament was the only entity that could make laws, set taxes, and consent to use of army. Um, citizens could also have guns, they had the right to a jury trial, they even had habeas corpus. So this set the foundation 
for a limited or constitutional monarchy. It basically stripped the king and queen more and more of their power of authority and handed it to over to this other body that now the king and queen had to go to to consult. It's William and Mary. Revered as some of the most amazing um, king and queen of England. There's even a school in Virginia named after them. Right. So just in case you're confused about the royal line of succession, here you are. So you have Elizabeth I, who is the official end of the Tudor line. Then you have James I, the nephew of Elizabeth, the son of the woman she killed. Uh, you have Charles I, who is a Stuart as well, who is the son of James. He is beheaded because Oliver Cromwell leads this rebellion against the monarchy. He dies and Parliament establishes Charles II, or puts Charles II back as king. Then you have James II, who is brother. He couldn't do it, so he gave it up to James. Uh, and then you have William and Mary. Mary is the daughter of King James, uh, and they overthrow. Anne, the younger sister of Mary and daughter of James, would come after Mary and become Queen Anne. And this was where you saw the end of the Protestant Protestant Stuart line, uh, because the only heir was Anne's half-brother, who was Catholic. And because England had had so many issues with Catholic kings, Parliament created a law that basically forbid any non-Protestant from ruling. So the Protestant cousins of Stuart ends and the House of Hanover begins. Uh, and Hanover is German. They are from the German province um, because they were the only ones left that had a blood right to the throne of England that were not Catholic. So incredibly dumb. So George I takes over. He couldn't speak a lick of English, but he took the crown because he was the only non-Catholic. There were like 50 other royals who had more claim than him, but you know, whatever. Uh, king George III would become king during the American Revolution, and the city of Charlotte is actually named after his wife. And if you look on, if you look here, you see King James III, right? And here is Charlotte, Queen Charlotte. If you notice where she's from, that's where we also get our county name from. So we live in the city of Charlotte, which is in Mecklenburg County. Dun, dun, dun. Right, they're really creative at naming things. All right, I'll see you guys next time.